Hey everyone, today we are going to talk about Figma and let me tell you, I absolutely love Figma. All my thumbnails are made in it and the engineering story that I am going to cover today from them is one of the best ones I have read in the recent times. Not just because of its technical learnings, but also due to how they manage the project. So let's talk about it. Till 2020, Figma had a single instance of Postgres database on the largest instance that AWS RDS had. And herein comes the first learning. By 2020, Figma was a pretty big company and still one instance worked for them. So you really don't need a distributed database for your to-do app. But since then, their data has grown 100x. That's a lot. With this increase, they started hitting their limits. As with many large Postgres databases, they saw performance hits. What were the problems? Well, they mentioned a few things. Postgres vacuuming was getting slow which is the background process in Postgres, which actually deletes the data from the disk um, when the rows are deleted. So in Postgres, after the rows are deleted, the data is actually not deleted from the disk. The row is just marked deleted. There is a background process which goes and actually reclaims that space from the disk. Next, Postgres was running out of transaction IDs. When that happens, Postgres won't have new transactions until a new transaction ID is available. So they were having so much transaction, so many transactions that new transaction IDs were not available for some time. Curiously, these are the very similar problems faced by Zerodha, which is India's largest stock broking company with a single instance Postgres. I had made a video about that. You can find the link in the description, but you see the pattern here with an extremely large Postgres instance with super massive scale. Another problem they had was their maximum IO operations per second were hitting the limit that was supported by AWS RDS. So actually they were exceeding the limit that was supported by AWS RDS. So that was also a problem for them. At this point, they decided to go distributed with Postgres. They weighed other decisions like moving to another database, but they thought about de-risking the project and playing to their strengths uh, to what they know and what they were experts at because they were using Postgres for so long, they were experts uh, at it by now. They didn't want to change their data model for another database or move the data, copy the data entirely to a different database because database migrations are hard and that might fail your project. That is another de-risking move again. Throughout the discussion, you will find many places where they chose incremental progress instead of large jumps to de-risk their project. This is very important in real life. The next decision they made was to not support all the features that they could have because their particular use case, Figma's particular use case did not need it. They were not designing a generic solution for everyone, but only for themselves and their needs. For example, they could have added cross shard atomic transactions, but they didn't because in their case, they did not need it. Yes, that means their system is not perfect, but a system does not need to be perfect. It just needs to be best for your use case. Designing particularly to their use case meant minimum changes to their actual application code. Again, another move to de-risk the project and make things simpler. To move with the project first, they divided the table into smaller tables and logical shards in the single instance they had. So they did not distribute it to many nodes at first. That's very hard. First, they solved a simpler problem of horizontally sharding the table at the application layer. Look at this diagram and it's Figma. Of course, they made really beautiful diagrams. This shows the difference between vertical partitioning and horizontally sharding a table. In one case, they put two related tables in their own database. And in the other case, they are taking a table and splitting it into ranges of values and putting it into their own separate logical shards. It's also important to mention that before doing all this, before doing horizontal sharding, they had already vertically partitioned their tables earlier. So you see, they are doing everything one step at a time. Okay, so how did they actually shard their data? Even if it's logical shards, they need to have solutions for a lot of problems that comes during sharding. First, they need to think about the shard key. The shard key determines which row of a table would be in which shard. Take this for example, there is this user's table and we say that user ID is its shard key. So we will say that user ID 1 to 100 will belong to shard 1 and user ID 101 to 200 will belong to shard 2. Got it? Now the challenge is to select a shard ID for the tables. 
they thought of having a unified key for all the tables but there's an issue there were no common keys in all kinds of tables they could have added extra keys into each table and created composite keys from them but again that's extra work and extra risk they wanted to de-risk so they decided to have different shard id for different groups of tables see this diagram tables user and user favorites are sharded by user id and file and file comments table is sharded by file id another problem is that some ranges of user ids or some ranges of file ids will have much more traffic than others so some shards might receive more traffic than others so let's say if file id 1 to 100 is getting much more requests than the others so this shard will have much more load than this shards so they need some way to equally distribute the file ids in all the tables equally distribute them so they decided to hash their keys on hashing it didn't follow the order so the keys would be equally distributed in all the shards but what's the problem here think about this it is now harder to do range queries because let's say i want file id 1 to 100 now i cannot get it from a single shard file id 1 might be here file id 2 might be here file id 4 might be here so the data can be distributed everywhere but they checked their own use case and they saw they did not have a lot of range queries so this wasn't actually a problem for them see when doing fewer things and designing only for the things they needed they were keeping things simple and their engineers sane now notice that the table sharded by the same shard key are also kept in the same shards for example the user favorites table and the user tables are kept in the same shard same shard and same shard why is that these tables are frequently accessed together they are joined together and accessed together so it makes sense that they're kept in the same shard on the same machine let's say i want to join and user table is here and user favorite tables is here i don't want to go to multiple uh, places to check it yes it might still happen that you will have to go to multiple shards but the chances are less here now they call these groups of tables which will be accessed together as co-locations or they named it coloss they even only allowed joins between the tables of the same coloss so i cannot join users table and files table uh, together and as i said the members of the same coloss will have the same shard key so they can be joined on this shard key but now that the data is distributed among the shards how will the application query it for example if you have a single database instance an application can just go and fire a sql query there and you will get the result but now the query needs to be changed and a separate query needs to be fired for each shard. It would be very difficult to go to each backend application and change the code to account for this. So they created their own query engine called dbproxy, which would take the query from the applications and query the shards it needs to query from. The query engine sits in between the application layer and the database shards. You will also see this PG bouncer here in between this. This is just a connection pooler. Let's not go into what a connection pooler is today. You can look that up. But ultimately, it connects to the database. You can see from the series of these pictures that dbproxy takes the query and converts it into a logical plan, then into a physical plan, and then that is executed on top of the shards. They also decided not to go for full SQL compatibility, but only how much that they needed. This again points to their philosophy of de-risking and doing fewer things so that the project can be completed in time and completed successfully. Well, let me come back to one of my previous points. Before they put data on separate physical shards, on separate physical database nodes, they did it all on logical shards on a single instance. They treated these logical shards as if they were physical shards. So they did all of the above things I mentioned only one one instance first with logical shards so if there was anything wrong with their design or anything wrong with their code they could just roll it back without much hassle of managing multiple physical nodes now they found a brilliant abstraction to create and represent the logical shards and that was using views for each shard of the table this is simple but clever each view now acts as a separate shard they didn't need to create new tables and move the data but represent the shards as views there was a risk that this might slow things down because views have performance impact 
and they did launch benchmarks on it and they saw that the impact was minimal so that was good the last step was to actually move from one physical node to multiple physical nodes due to the stepwise approach it was less complex than it could have been um, they had to take the logical shards and distribute it among multiple physical shards so this is three physical shards and the logical shards are distributed among them they still had to account for failures where some shards didn't end up working so it was not very simple so that was it it was a great engineering story from my point of view their approach to the problem and their first principle technical thinking was awesome to read about do they read their full blog in from the description there were a lot of things that i didn't mention that you will find in the blog that will be all for today do leave a like and subscribe for more engineering videos like this see you in the next one